I'm Jean Deville of the Dongfang Hour. Welcome to another Deep Dive episode. Today, we discuss how China's space station currently flying over our heads at roughly an altitude of 400 kilometers is able to navigate and control its trajectory and attitude in the vacuum of space. We previously did a full episode presenting the essentials of the Chinese space station, so do feel free to check that one out before getting into this video. And without any further ado, let's get started. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Controlling a spacecraft trajectory and attitude is unsurprisingly very important. This can be to make sure that the spacecraft inserts itself in the correct orbit, that it can make up for any perturbations coming from a docking spacecraft or from external forces generated from the atmosphere, it can be to uh, avoid space debris, and it can also be to point a spacecraft in a specific direction, uh, for example, for thermal, for electrical, or for communication purposes. Now, just a quick reminder on the definitions here. When we are talking about the position of a spacecraft within a given orbit, we are generally talking about the center of gravity. But for a given position of a center of gravity, a spacecraft can actually have different angular orientations. And this is called attitude defined by three angles, which are roll, pitch, and yaw. So the question that we're asking ourselves today is, um, what are the mechanisms and the actuators that enable the Chinese space station, and more specifically the Tianhe core module, to control its position and attitude and basically just get around in space? The answer will be that there are notably four ways that the Chinese space station does this, and we are going to cover them all. So let's get started with one of the most traditional way of doing things, chemical thrusters. The Tianhe core module is equipped with a healthy number of 30 thrusters on board, which have various objectives depending on their size, their power, and just the direction that they fire in. 26 of these uh, thrusters out of the 30 are chemical thrusters, which is a mature technology that has been used in the space industry for many, many decades. And generally, it uses a monopropellant or a bipropellant combination to produce thrust. In the case of the Chinese space station, it is bipropellant thrusters, likely a mix of monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. And this is a common propellant mix also used on other spacecraft involved in China's space station and crewed space program, namely the Shenzhou crewed spacecraft and the Tianzhou cargo spacecraft. And actually, this makes a lot of sense considering that the Tianzhou, for example, will have the role of refueling the space station. Now, where are these thrusters actually situated? The Tianhe core module can overall be divided into three sections. You have the multi-docking nod and two cylindrical sections. The larger cylindrical section at the rear can actually be split into a pressurized section where the Taikonauts can work and live. And then you have a non-pressurized propulsion compartment at the very back. And this is naturally where most of the thrusters and engines are. And so this compartment has a diameter of 4.2 meters and a height of 2.1 meters, and it is absolutely full of propellant. It weighs 4.3 tons when filled with propellant, but only 487 kilograms when it's without fuel. And this is what we call dry mass. Out of the 26 chemical thrusters, four are larger orbital control thrusters, producing a force to accelerate the space station in a given direction. And they're placed on the outside wall, pointing towards the actual direction. And you can also see a very visible inclination angle uh, and that's probably to avoid the exhaust getting too close to the uh, station itself. It would have probably been more efficient to put these thrusters at the rear of the propulsion compartment rather than on the side, but this was not possible due to the fact that the Tianzhou cargo spacecraft docking port is exactly in that position. So that's for orbital control. The other 22 thrusters out of the 26 are for attitude control, and they enable Tianhe-1, the core module, to control and modify pitch, yaw, and roll angles. These thrusters are situated mostly on the side of the propulsion compartment, as you can see here, but you can also find some thrusters on the small cylindrical module of the Tianhe-1. These thrusters are naturally much smaller than the orbital control thrusters, and they're oriented in different directions to control all three angles of roll, pitch, and yaw. So that's 26 
chemical thrusters. There are four remaining thrusters that I haven't mentioned, and which are first in China's crewed spaceflight program. And these are Hall effect thrusters. These Hall effect thrusters, or HETs, have a maximum thrust of 80 millinewtons and a rated power of 1.35 kilowatts. So they're really light thrust engines. And they're manufactured by the Shanghai Space Propulsion Institute, also known as the Institute 801 of the Sixth Academy, which can be understood pretty much as the people who are in charge of much of the small thrusters involved in China's space program. Hall effect thrusters are relatively more recent technology compared to chemical propulsion thrusters. And they exploit something called the Hall effect to ionize, then accelerate an inert gas effectively producing thrust. The really cool part about this technology is that the resource that's used is electrical power, which is a renewable energy in space, thanks to the solar arrays of the Chinese space station or just any spacecraft in general. Beyond electrical power, ion thrusters also use inner gas, generally xenon, which is obviously a non-renewable source in space, but thanks to the significantly higher specific impulse, meaning efficiency, of these ion thrusters compared to chemical thrusters, a refuel in xenon probably takes place much less often. Speaking of refueling, the bipropellants used for the chemical thrusters will need to be periodically replenished by the Tianzhou cargo spacecraft, which has an automatic refueling capability as it docks to the Chinese space station. The propellant of the Hall effect thrusters, on the other hand, so the xenon, will have to be replenished manually, meaning that the Taikonauts will have to perform an EVA, an extra vehicular activity, also known as a spacewalk, to swap the cylinders of inert gas manually or with the help of the robotic arm. And that's why you can see uh, here on the picture that there are ramps nearby the Hall effect thrusters outside of the Chinese space station. Luckily for the Taikonauts, these tanks shouldn't be too big or changed too frequently, thanks to the high specific impulse of ion thrusters. To put Hall effect thruster technology a little bit into perspective here, the mere fact that you have such a technology on the Chinese space station is already quite a step uh, forward for China, which has been investing massively into electrical propulsion research over the past 30 years. Today, China's satellites and spacecraft still strongly rely on chemical propulsion, especially compared to foreign competitors such as Airbus and Boeing, which all have all electric satellite buses. But China, nevertheless, has been testing this technology on a number of test satellites, such as the Shijian 9A, the Shijian 13, the Shijian 17, and the Shijian 20, and with laboratories like the Lanzhou Institute of Physics, as well as the Institute 801 that I mentioned previously, taking the lead in electrical propulsion research. Worth noting also, the Chinese media frequently notes that the Chinese space station is the first space station to ever have electrical propulsion. Although I note that this comparison is not entirely fair considering that the ISS to a large extent is built upon technologies of the 1990s and the 2000s. Finally, the space station core module has a last trick up its sleeve. And it's these six odd looking round spheres that you can see on the junction of the small and larger cylindrical modules. These are control moment gyros, or CMGs for short, and they play a major role in the attitude control of the Chinese space station. The way CMGs work is that you have a disk continuously spinning inside each sphere, and this spinning sphere is installed on a gimbal that is motorized and that can tilt the spinning rotor. So if the gimbal tilts the spinning disc, there's a change in angular momentum, which triggers a gyroscopic torque that is used for attitude control. Now, the math behind what I just described can be a little bit complex to put out there, but the effect is actually extremely easy to demonstrate practically with something called the bicycle wheel experiment. Basically, what you see here is um, the bicycle wheel is the spinning disc, and the person's hands is the gimbal of the control moment gyro. And you can see that when you tilt the disc in a given direction, a torque that's orthogonal to both the disc spin axis and the perturbation is generated, spinning the chair that here represents the space station in a given uh, rotational motion. One big advantage of CMGs compared to thrusters is that they really don't use any fuel. They only require electrical power to run, and which as mentioned previously, this is a renewable energy on the space station. Also, they are able to output a very high amount of torque. And China's first experimental space station, Tiangong-1, for example, was equipped with six 200 Newton meter second CMGs. And um, while the value is not exactly known for the Chinese space station, it is estimated that the CMGs on the Tianhe-1 could be around 1,000 
newton meter seconds. And this can be compared to the massive 4,760 newton meter seconds CMGs that are used on the ISS. But on the other hand, that's also because the ISS is also larger and heavier by a factor of four or five. CMGs can enable the space station to do energy heavy maneuvers like turning around the space station, making sure that it is always oriented in the right direction, for example, for either solar arrays to face the sun, or it can also be to compensate, as mentioned early on in the video, uh, for the perturbations linked to a docking of an incoming spacecraft. Now, control moment gyros aren't all roses either. It comes with some disadvantages, such as, first of all, the heavy weight. For example, each control moment gyro on the Tianhe 1 weighs a whopping 125 kilograms. And so that's literally 700 to 800 kilograms for the CMGs alone on the Chinese space station. And they can also run into something called saturation issues, where you need, no matter what, some assistance from ordinary thrusters uh, to get out of those um, sticky situations. And finally, CMGs are mechanical systems, which by definition are more susceptible to failure. So how many CMGs do you actually need on a space station? To answer this question, this actually depends on how the CMGs are built on the Chinese space station. If they are single gimbal CMGs, meaning the spinning disk is only tilted by the gimbal around one axis, then you would need three CMGs to be able to control a spacecraft in all three directions. For the Chinese space station, I was not able to find the information, but as they have six CMGs on board, they are likely single axis, as six sounds like a redundancy measure for three single axis CMGs. And last fun fact, the CMGs are placed on the exterior of the Tianhe core module rather than inside, as was the case for the Tiangong 1 and the Tiangong 2 experimental stations. And the main reason for this is for noise level suppression for the Taikonauts, as the high velocity disks that are spinning inside the CMGs at several thousand RPM can generate a lot of noise. Finally, did you know that the attitude control of the Chinese space station could also be performed by a spacecraft that's docked to one of the docking ports? That's notably the case for the Tianzhou spacecraft that's docked to either the rear or the aft docking port. Although Tianzhou doesn't have the highly efficient and fancy electrical thrusters nor the CMGs of the Tianhe 1, it's nevertheless equipped with 36 engines. You have four orbital control engines and 32 attitude control engines. And more of interest, probably the strategic position of the Tianzhou at both ends of the Tianhan 1 is helpful as the distance to the center of gravity of the space station can increase the amount of torque generated. But this can come in handy, for example, when you have an incoming spacecraft like a Shenzhou that's docking to the multi-docking knot on one end, creating perturbations for the space station, but these can be compensated at the other end with a Tianzhou spacecraft that is using its engines to create compensating torque. On a related topic, we also know that the Meng Tian and the Wen Tian experimental modules that will come next year will have attitude control systems, including chemical thrusters and control moment gyros, and they'll be able to contribute as necessary to the attitude control of the entire space station. But I was unable to find any detailed information on this, so we'll probably have to wait for the launch of both modules in the coming months to find out more. If there's already detailed information, by the way, out there that I have missed, but a viewer or listener is already aware of, please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below on that, and we will pin the comment to share it with absolutely everybody. And so this brings us to the end of this short episode on the Chinese space station propulsion systems. I really hope you found it interesting and that it brought value. And if that's the case, do give us a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to see more of this kind of content. And apart from that, I'm Sean Deville from the Dongfang Hour. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in next week's episode.